My name is uh, Mr. Cleophas. I teach at Regional Curriculum Management College. And today, I want to discuss about audit planning. Audit planning is a topic uh, in auditing and assurance intermediate level. Again, it is a topic in uh, uh, auditing ATD level three. And again, it is a subtopic in advanced auditing and assurance, which is uh, the paper under, which is a paper under specialization in advanced level, which is a uh, paper uh, specialization number two, S2. And auditing and assurance, it's one of the very important areas. Many people, they do not get well the process of auditing. And I want to explain auditing as a process. So that at least you can get to the point of planning for an audit. I will start by knowing or letting you know uh, the definition of an audit. Under the nature, purpose, and objective of an audit, you know what is all about auditing. Then you know the objective of an audit where we say ISA, that's International Standards on Auditing. Number 200, it provides that the primary objective of an audit is to enable auditor express an opinion on whether the financial statements which he has audited gives a true and fair view. So that is briefly about the objective. Later you'll go to understand the advantages of an audit and then you get to know the types of audits. Then you also need to know more about the international standards on auditing, distinction between auditing and accounting. And again, this is a concept which is very, very important. Uh, I normally come under the nature, purpose and objective of an audit, uh, which is the concept of detection of frauds and errors. Many people think that the auditor's primary responsibility is to detect frauds and errors. But auditor knows that his responsibility and objective of the audit is to express an opinion. So it is important to know that the primary objective of detecting frauds and errors in the company's financial statements rests with the company management. Detection of frauds and errors is just incidental to an audit of financial statement. And thus, it is a secondary responsibility of the auditor. And after knowing that, then you will realize that there's a concept called expectations gap, where many users of the financial statements, those who lack knowledge in auditing, and in also accounting, they think that the primary responsibility of the auditor is to detect errors and frauds. But auditor knows that his responsibility and objective of the audit is to express an opinion. The concept is there called the expectations gap. This gap is expected to be there. Why? It, the gap we normally say it is the difference, expectations gap we say, it is the difference in perception between the auditor and the users of the audited financial statements. Pertaining to the audit of financial statements and the auditor's responsibility. What do people think auditor should do and what auditor does, then there is a difference between what they expect auditor to do and what the, what the auditor does. So there is a difference between what they expected to be done and what exactly is done by the auditor. The gap is expected to be there. Why? Because most of these uh, users, they do not have knowledge in auditing and accounting. And that's why under the concept you have, expectations gap has got three elements. One is performance gap, another one is the liability gap, another one is standard gap. I'll be explaining this, elaborating on that concept. But today, I want to get you to a level where we start planning for an audit. Now, after you cover that topic, nature, purpose, and objective, you need to go ahead and cover the auditor's legal environment and framework. 
Under the auditor's legal environmental framework, you need to understand ethics governing auditing. You need to know the professional ethics. You need to know the fundamental ethics. After that, you need to look at the legal environment of the auditor very well by going through the appointment of the auditor. You need to know the process on how an audit of a company is appointed. After that, you need to know the people or parties who are disqualified from being appointed as auditors of a company. Then you need to know how auditor, after he has been appointed, he is remunerated. How is the auditor's remuneration fixed? After that, you need also to know about uh, the rights of the auditor. Then you need again to understand how the auditor can resign from office, that is the auditor's resignation from office and the reasons or some of the reasons why auditor may decide to resign from the office. Then understand again how auditor can be removed from office and the circumstances which can lead to auditor's removal. After that, the assumption is you have been appointed now as the auditor of a company. After that appointment, Orally, you'll be appointed, and before accepting or before making a decision on whether to either accept the appointment, because already you have known about appointment, now you have been appointed that assumption. So, assuming you have uh, been appointed the, or an audit of a company now, then you need to make a decision on whether should you accept this appointment or should you reject the appointment. But for you to make such a decision, there must be some factors you consider. One, you must know the background of this company which has appointed you. You must know your independence as a firm and as an individual auditor. You need also to know the legality of this client business or the company which has appointed you. Is it legally operational or it is doing activities which it has not been incorporated or it was not incorporated to perform? From there, Again, you need to check on the risk associated with that appointment. You need also to know or to check on the uh, need to communicate with the previous auditor or with the outgoing auditor. It's very important before taking up an audit assignment. After you, geographical location is also another thing you need to consider before you take up the assignment. Now, after you consider all those matters plus also others, then the assumption is you are eligible to take up the assignment or now you can decide, let you take the assignment. Orally, you have been appointed. You have considered those matters. Then, will you take up the assignment or not? You will take the assignment, that is the assumption now after taking into consideration all the matters. But orally, you may accept by saying, yes, after appointing me, I accept the appointment. But you need to do it formally. Why? We normally say that documentary audit evidence, it is more reliable than oral audit evidence. That is why after accepting orally, you need to document that acceptance. By writing a letter, we call the engagement letter. Engagement letter is a letter written by auditor to the client company to formally accept the appointment to be the audit of that company. Right, there are some contents, purpose of the letter ETC. Now, you have done the letter. The assumption is after you have accepted that appointment formally by writing that letter, you need to start planning on how to do the audit. And that is how we come to audit planning ISA 300. And I want to take you briefly about audit planning session one. Audit planning is development of the overall audit strategy. Said, audit planning is development of the overall audit strategy. What is this audit strategy? The audit strategy includes the nature of the work you're going to do, the scope of that work, and the timing of the audit work. Nature, timing, and the scope of the audit work, it is all 
we call the audit strategy. Why should somebody plan an audit? Why is it that you don't just go and start doing the auditing? Uh -huh. We have some of the objectives behind or the need behind planning for an audit. One, whenever you plan for your work, then you're going to achieve your objective or your set goal. So audit planning enables auditor to achieve the audit objective. Number two, when you plan your work, you reduce the chances of giving wrong conclusion. So audit planning reduces what we call audit risk. That is, chances or possibility of the auditor giving wrong opinion or conclusion on the financial statements. Again, when you plan, you will be in able to complete the audit work in good time. So it facilitates completion of the audit work in good time. When you plan your work, you minimize omissions again. Because whatever is to be performed, you determine or you just know it before performing that test. So when you plan your work, it minimizes uh, omissions in audit testing. And those are the purposes of this uh, audit planning or the objective of audit planning. And I want again to just uh, discuss again about audit planning considerations or audit planning uh, pro considerations and procedures. We can call them audit planning procedures and considerations. Yeah, that is what I was looking for. Now, what do you consider or which are the procedures you perform when planning? One, you need to understand the company's background information. That's one of the procedures or the factors or matters to consider when planning. Two, you need to review the company's financial statements and the reports. Another thing, you need to consider the need to engage an expert or the need of an expert during the audit and to consider it when planning. So consider the need for an expert involvement during the audit. Again, when planning, you need also to consider to what extent are you going to rely on the company systems. So you need to consider the extent of the reliance to be placed on the internal control systems of the company. Again, you may need to, to rely on the audit function or the audit, internal audit department. So again, when planning, consider the need or the extent of relying on the internal audit department or the internal audit department of the company. Again, when planning, you also need to meet senior management of the company so that they can give you more information about the areas you expect to find some problems when you're doing the audit. So consider meeting the senior management of the company to discuss those problematic areas during the audit. Again, when planning, you need to consider those significant periods. Significant periods, like the date of the stock take. Consider because you need to attend or send somebody to represent you during the stock take. So that is during planning, some of the matters you consider. Right? Now, when we say audit planning is development of the overall audit uh, strategy, you need to understand which are the strategies that auditor can use. Uh -huh. See? You need to consider the strategies that auditor can use. These are the approaches which can be used. One of the approach that can be used when planning for an audit is system-based audit approach. I've said one of the approach which can be used when planning for an audit is system-based audit approach. We also have risk-based audit approach. And again, we also have business risk audit approach. In my next video, I shall be discussing those approaches to an audit of financial statements. That will be my next session under audit planning. It will be audit planning.